Jesus. Where the name is Jesus in the midnight hour now, Jesus. <laughs> Better watch out. Y'all don't know I can get real crazy. You've, I've not been real crazy lately, so you don't know I can get real crazy if I want to. I want to tell you something. Um, there, in about the next 60 days in our ministry, there are things happening so fast right now and accelerating so quickly that it's, uh, it's, it's very exciting. It's so exciting. Um, you know, for everybody in the world, the past year's been really tough. Some people have not had their businesses open. Schools have been closed in some areas. And I just sat on that front, front row and felt like saying, time's up, devil. Time's up. Because uh, all testings only have a time element connected to them. Whatever you go through, remember this. This is a little nugget for you. That whatever you deal with, it is time sensitive. And it only can last for a certain period. Now, you can, with your mouth or attitude, stretch it out longer. Or you can cut it off sooner. Good preaching, Perry. Amen. All right. I'm going to take notes on myself if I keep talking this well. But um, we are going to see some things happen. And I'm going to go ahead and speak this out because I believe Ramp has heard this word from the Lord before. But I was in prayer uh, last uh, Thursday, and I have a man who is a very dear Arab friend of mine. His background is Muslim, but he's, he has literally worked with and hung around so many Christian preachers, Morris Sorello, and uh, you know, all, you just name them. They know him personally, and he worked with them. And uh, he was in Ramp Cleveland on Tuesday night. He was clapping and just going, you know, having a good time, you know. And uh, on Thursday night, I was praying, and I heard, and it, I didn't just hear that our ministry would have something there. I heard the words, Ramp Israel. I really heard the words, Ramp Israel. So on Tuesday night, his name is Shweki. Shweki from Jerusalem is there. Rick says, I need to talk to you, and we go out. And he says, I need to tell you a dream I had. He proceeded to tell me a dream, and he said, it's about, it's about Israel. And I said, you will not believe this. But I said, there's something going on. So I, I, and I, I don't think he would mind me saying this. He's a businessman. He's a very wealthy businessman. He's the number one antiquities and coin dealer in all of Israel. Wow. Uh, that's all I need to say, bro. And uh, so anyway, just a little thing. I knew him 30-some him years ago when he was a peddler on the street selling postcards. And a Jewish man laid hands on him and said, God spoke to me to tell you you're going to be a millionaire one day. Uh, because of your spirit. He has, doesn't, he has a gentle spirit. He, has, he told Pam when she had COVID, I pray for you every day. I pray for you every day. And I said to him, Shweki, we need a building. We need a big building with a lot of parking. He said, where do you want it? I have land in Jericho. <laughs> he does. He has big property in Jericho. He says, but you know, uh, we, we feed people in Bethlehem. We've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars feeding poor people in Bethlehem. Our ministry has. He said, maybe Bethlehem. This is Jesus' hometown. Jesus would like that. Jesus would like for you to go to his hometown. And then uh, we talked about Tiberias, and we talked about northern Israel. And I'm just, I'm just going to speak this out. I'm going to speak this by faith. Because the Bible said if you feel like you have a vision, you write it down, make it plain, and then you run with it. So what we do in the New Testament is if we feel like the Lord has spoken to us in any way, we begin to speak it. And Pam, Pam will tell you, I did this I spoke Manifest 12 years before it happened because God told me I'd have a TV program named Manifest. It was 12 years later. So we're not going to try to force this. It will happen naturally. Ooh, I, I just felt that. It's going to happen naturally. We're going to, this door comes and then somebody contacts you. And then do you all realize with our TV program over there among the Arabs and Jews, I have young converts that have been won to the Lord through uh, Christian television programming. I'm talking about guys like in their 20s and 30s that were orthodox, that went away from God. Um, you wouldn't believe it. And so we've got a base over there of people. So I prophesy tonight. God, I feel the Holy Ghost, my God. Oh, Jesus. That Lord, the gospel started in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and everything goes 
full circle. It must end in Jerusalem and Israel and Samaria. It began, it'll end there. And I prophesy ramp Israel in Jesus' name. The right, the buildings, the property, the people, people from the land, Arabs and Jews. There is no peace without the Messiah. Arabs and Jews sitting together in the same building. Christians sitting with them. And in Jesus' name, you will flow through this and you will open the door. And everybody said amen. amen. I, absolutely. Look, you know there's things you know. This is in my nowhere now. It's not in my head. It dropped into my spirit. And so this is going to be exciting. And we also had another door open. I'm not going to tell you about that because that's something down the road for our ministry. We're buying. Uh, we've already, No, we bought it. <laughs> I'm saying we're buying. We just bought 160 acres of property with a house on it. Uh, we're going to do some kind of, well, not even going to speak that. I'm not, we're on the internet. I don't, Pam is nodding her head. Shut up, Perry. You talk too much. Because I'm, I'm like Karen. I'm a visionary. I see it way before it gets here. I talk about it way before it comes. And uh, then people look at you at the moment like, really? And then years later they say, well, you know, I was there when Brother Perry said that. Pray of God, hallelujah. You know, and they were the ones that didn't believe it. But, you know, now that they see it, they believe it. So I just want to announce to you it's going to be exciting. You're in the best season of history. I know, it, I know you don't think that, but you're in the best season of history that we've ever had for this generation, without a doubt. And you better get ready because this is going to move fast and all your gifting and all your learning and all that you're encountering, you're going to have to use. You're going to have to use. So learn everything you can learn about the subject God has put you in. Learn everything about that call, that focus of what you feel. If it's counseling, if it's music, if it's ministry, if it's children's ministry, if it's evangelism, whatever it might be, learn everything you can. And then every opportunity you have, put it into operation and use it. Now, finally, my brethren and sisterin. I am excited, so excited, that Chosen is coming to our, oh, the only Warrior Fest I have this year was the summer. We didn't know what COVID would do. That's one reason why. Yeah. July 9th, 10th, 11th, Cleveland, Tennessee, Ramp Cleveland, the big building. You're coming, and we opened up registration and have 4,000 kids already in five days. Oh. Five days. And our, uh, Karen knows this. We pull from the Carolinas more, from Virginia, Maryland, uh, New Jersey, New York, that whole eastern seaboard kind of uh, the edge. Of, so it's a whole different group of young people. So it excites me that, that there'll be a different group there. You'll be able to minister. And I want to I chosen, I'm going to tell you something. You've never been to a warrior fest. We will wear you out. So, you know, you might end up ministering like five times in just one service, eight times. And you, you will be, you know, when we had uh, the former team that we had, they literally were going, <gasps> they were huffing and puffing. Like, you know, like the one, they did a dance one time up there where they fell out on the platform. They like they never got up. You know, it's like, please let me lay here. And they, like they were slain in the spirit, you know, lay hands on yourself and fall out here. But anyway, uh, it's going to be wonderful. And I want to let you know that if you have your Bible, let me get right into the word today. Appreciate any of you that are watching online. We know that a lot of people watch this maybe later if they're not able to. And um, I'm going to look at Acts chapter 27. And I'm going to be focusing on an event, a, 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 a major event that happened in Acts chapter 27 and 28. And instead of me going to the verses because it would stretch it out too long, I'll just make the point and tell you what's in the story. Is that okay? Here we go. One verse of scripture. Paul is on a ship, and all of a sudden, in Acts chapter 27, verse 14, but not, I've taken glasses off to read, but not long after, there arose against it, against the ship, a temptuous wind called Eurachlodon. Everybody say Eurachlodon. Now, I'm going to minister on the subject of why. God lets Eurachlodon hit your boat. Why does God let Eurachlodon? What is Eurachlodon? It's a sudden storm. 
Why does he allow it to hit your life? Why does he allow it to hit your, your focus? Why does he allow it to hit the direction that you're heading? And because we have this conception that if we are in the will of the Lord, nothing bad will happen to us. <laughs> Don't tell Paul that. He got shipwrecked, beat up, beaten with rods, stoned and left for dead, and he was in the will of God. Don't tell Job that. He lost everything he had, but he was in the will of God. So it is not the fact that, watch me, you're not blessed because you are exempt from trouble. You are blessed because you keep surviving through it. You're not blessed because you never had a storm. Because can I tell you, you'll never know whether your faith works or not till you're in the ship. You are blessed because you keep coming through one after the other after the other. In fact, we ought to have shirts made with a great big S on the shirt that doesn't mean Superman or Superwoman. It means survivor. Because there's something about believers even in persecuted countries, that they keep on coming through the mess. Now, I want, to, I want to show you something here because I've learned something from the Bible that when you take stories in the Bible, you can find a pattern beginning to emerge in many of them that you can make it applicable to your situation in modern time. I'm going to give you one quick example. This is not in the message, but in the 12th chapter of Revelation, Satan is the dragon and he attacks the man-child who, uh, the woman who is Israel. And you can read, for example, where it says he tries to devour the child as soon as it's born. That's the enemy trying to stop your blessing the moment you get it. Then it says that he persecutes the woman. And then it says, and that persecution always follows your salvation. Nobody mess with you till you start talking Jesus. Then after the persecution, she's driven into a wilderness, into a dry place. And so then you go through a spell where you can't feel God, can't sense God, nothing's moving. You don't feel like reading your Bible. And then you keep reading. In other words, if you keep reading the process of what the dragon does, the last thing he does, now he is the dragon and he's spewing water out of his mouth to try to drown the woman. I was at Jensen Franklin's church preaching years ago, two in the morning, studying this. I said, I, there's something here. First of all, dragon is a mythological creature back in the days of King James. That's why they translated dragons. There was stories of knights fighting dragons. But it's really, it really in Greek is the word for serpent. So when you read in the King James translation dragon, it actually is the Greek word for a keen-eyed serpent, a serpent that has great eyes that can see in the distance and see things. All right. But when you read about the, the dragon, we know that a dragon does not produce water from its mouth. You all know what a dragon dragon is supposed to produce. Would you tell me what comes out of a dragon's mouth? Fire. And it puzzled me. Why doesn't the meta, the analogy here say the dragon breathed fire from his mouth to burn the woman? What is a dragon doing with water? Because water is a metaphor for the Holy Spirit. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of what? Living water. With joy we draw water from the wells of salvation. I will pour out, that's rain, that's water of my spirit. And the dragon has water in its mouth. And I, it hit me one. It just really hit me. That whole chapter deals with Satan being the accuser of the brethren. And see, the last attack that Satan does. See, he, I don't know why I'm preaching this, but it's, it's going to be all right. You see, he, first of all, tries to stop your blessing before you get it. Then he tries to persecute you. If that don't work, he'll throw you in a dry place. And if none of that works, the last thing will be spirit-filled Christians. Spirit-filled Living water is supposed to be coming out of their belly. But instead of them using their mouth to speak good things, they start accusing you. The last attack is believers accusing other believers. Meaning the believer becomes the accuser of the brethren. Come on, talk to me somebody. So I can go to Revelation 12, for example. And I can show you those four things that happen. How the enemy moves against the woman and the man child. And they're the exact four things he does to a believer. So I, I just hit myself on the leg and I got shingles. <laughs> if you all know what shingles are. So I just felt that glow through. God. It wasn't the Holy Ghost either. I went, Ooh. Okay. <laughs> let, me, let me switch hands while I preach. Slap this leg <laughs> for the glory of God. Now, if you go back to the story, what I'm going to show you. As I'm going to show you that in this storm, there were four things that happened. 
And this is the fourfold process of what happens when a major Eurachlodon or a major spiritual, physical, financial, uh, mental, whatever the case may be, when a storm comes into your life. Now, first of all, what's Paul doing on this boat? Here's what Paul is doing on the boat. Paul had stood before the governor. And he stood before some of the leaders that were in Israel in that day. And they were, he was actually giving them a testimony of his conversion. And so he'd been arrested. So in order to, to actually, this, this is pretty interesting what he did because he looked at those men, high-level men, and he said, now I appeal unto Caesar. Now, when he said, I appeal unto Caesar as a Roman citizen, it is the same thing as saying, we're taking this case to the Supreme Court. There is no higher court you can go to in the United States outside the Supreme Court. Outside, there's nothing higher. Caesar was Nero. Nero was the worst emperor of all the emperors that came before him. Most of the other emperors simply went by strict Roman law. They did arrest people. There were times they tortured people. They fought battles. But Nero, just so you'll know a little bit about him... Nero murdered his wife. He, first of all, history says he was very schizophrenic. We would say today a split personality. He murdered his wife and married a kid that looked like his wife that was a boy. And so he, he was, he, you could tell just by that he was a little bit messed up to say the least from the start. Then uh, he got to the point where he's persecuting Christians and he invents a slide with razors. And he puts the Christian on top and as they slide down it splits them from the lower area all the way up to their body. He then takes something called the Appian Wave, which was a road they were building, and he took crosses, put Christians on and put, poured oil on them and lit them up so that they could work at night with burning Christian bodies. He also was one of the men that put Christians in the uh, big uh, theater there in Rome. You've seen the amphitheater or the theater, they call it, uh, the Colosseum, I'm sorry. And they would, they would actually turn... Put, put blood on Christians' bodies or dead animal skins and turn hungry lions loose that would gnaw on the leg and the Christian would die. This man was the master of torture. This is the same man, by the way, who beheaded the Apostle Paul and beheaded the Apostle Peter. This gives you an idea, watch, of the man Paul has just appealed to. His name is Nero Caesar. And so... In order to get to Rome, how do you get there? You can't take a plane, you can't take a car, you take a ship. Now the problem was this, it was wintertime. If you've never been to Israel in wintertime, and we do go in what's classified wintertime, most of the time in the month of November the weather's nice and fair, and I've actually been there when it didn't rain at all. But I was there one time when I was in Caesarea where this boat was leaving that Paul got on and was headed to Rome. And I have never seen wind or waves in my life like this. The wind was blowing close to 60 miles per hour. The waves were just rocking. And I literally stood. We went there to tape. And we, they said, the weather's bad there. You might not want to tape there. And we got there. And I literally, um, Micah, could take my body and move it forward like I wanted to fall. And the wind was pushing me back. Now, here's the problem. Paul said to the man who owned the ship, I perceive that this voyage is going to be a big problem not only for us but for this ship. See, Paul knew it was wintertime. He knew that this storm called Eurachlodon normally hit in wintertime. Here's the problem. The ship's master is making a lot of money by transferring over 200 slaves on this boat. He is paid per slave. He has a deadline to get them to Rome. So he said, boy, I don't care what you're a slave on my ship. You don't tell me how to run my business nor my boat. So Paul knew he was in danger when he got on the boat. Now let me tell you something. You got to watch who you let on your ship. Because if you remember, there was a group of men who let a man named Jonah on their boat. And when Jonah got on their boat, everything was supposed to be fine and dandy, good travel season, but a storm arose. And they said, there's a problem because this is the gods becoming angry. And Jonah said, well, it must be me. And watch this. They had to throw Jonah, read your Bible in the book of Jonah, off of their boat to get their storm to stop. Sometimes you got to throw people off your life. 
Sometimes you got to get rid of folks, come on, to get your storm to stop. To get your trouble to quit. Well, that's, uh, that, that's, that's free. That's just a, an additional note that I wanted to say to you. Now, I want to show you what begins to happen as your rockladon begins to hit. I'm going to show you four things. Number one, and all this is in your Bible. Number one, the winds become contrary. In other words, they're moving in one direction, but everything is pushing against them. What is happening where they're supposed to be going it's not flowing. So there is pressure or resistance pushing them back instead of the wind normally supposed to be moving them forward. So instead of the wind cooperating with them, the wind is working against them. Now when this begins to happen, the Bible says that for 14 days no sun, moon, or stars appeared. You must understand that they did not have GPS. That the only way they knew where they were headed was by watching the stars at night. Especially the North Star. Because you can tell where East, West, and South is when you see the little star on the handle of that Ursa, uh, major there in the, uh, in the sky. So now, imagine this now. There is no light and there's no light to give them direction. Level number one of any storm is you will get in the storm... And you will get in the, in the problem and you will start realizing God isn't telling me nothing. I'm not hearing anything. I have no revelation. I'm trying to figure this out. How did this happen? Or I'm trying to figure out how was I so stupid to let that happen. And I'm needing God to show me what to do right now to help me through this. But why is it there's no light on my situation? I, I, I hope I'm preaching to a few young people that's been through something like this. There's no light on my situation. So what does Paul do? The Bible said they started lightening the ship. In other words, they started lightening the loads around them. Anything that was an excessive load that was going to weigh them down. They begin to throw it off of the boat. So in the middle of not hearing anything, they said, here's what we're going to do. We don't even know where we're going. We don't even know where this boat's going to end up. But what we've got to do is lighten the load so we don't sink in the middle of this. I feel like preaching in just a minute. and You better stay with me. So they begin to take off what we, the Bible in the New Testament would say it this way. Lay aside the weight and the sin that does so easily beset you. So now when you're in it, you got to examine yourself first thing and say, is there somebody I need to lay aside? Is there something I need to lay aside? Is there something that's creating more pressure on me than I need that pressure to be created? Now the second thing that happens, and this gets really crazy, is the ship then starts moving inward and it hits quicksand. Now, you've seen the movie, and I'm an Indiana Jones fan, you know, if you've ever watched all of the, those movies. And there's one of them, it's crazy, where there's this big python, and he's getting in quicksand. There is literal quicksand that will suck a person in. So as the boat is coming in, look out, I'm about to preach here now. Now, not only are they getting no direction at all, there's no light or revelation on why am I going through this. God, would you talk to me, please? All of a sudden, they are stuck in quicksand. In other words, they can't move. There's no movement. They're not going backwards. They're not going forward. They're not going to the left. They're not going to the right. They're just stuck in one spot. It reminds me of the battle of Elah in Israel. Goliath, the Philistines are on one mountain. Israel is on the other. Your Bible tells you this. Goliath is in the valley taunting them, send me a man to fight, send me a man to fight. You know what makes this whole story so bad that these Israelites are stuck for 40 days. Nobody wants to fight. Nobody wants to challenge. No, and here's what makes it bad. Do you know what the Jews are praying in the morning, in the evening? They're praying something called the Shema. In English, it looks like Shema, but it's pronounced Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. When you pray that prayer in that time, there was a line in it that said, And no man shall stand before thee 
all the days of thy life. And they're out there saying, no man shall stand before thee. And they're hearing, send me a man to fight. The next day, no man shall stand before me. What's wrong with you, Hebrew chicken? Send me a man to fight. Oh, no man will stand before thee. In other words, they're praying prayers that aren't getting, are not getting them anywhere. Because the prayer is from a routine and they're not trying to figure out what to do. They can't figure it out. Watch this because the battle is stuck in one spot for 40 days. So now as, the, as they've gone through the storm, now they're in quicksand. The boat can't go to the left. The boat can't go to the right. They are stuck in one spot. Look, and you're not going to get out and try to mess with the boat. Do you know why? Because you will sink in the sand. You are dead. So now not only was he 14 days without no illumination. Oh, my God, no sun, moon, and stars. Now they're stuck in quicksand. So we go from there where now there's no movement. Not only was there no direction for me, now I have no movement at all. So the next thing that happens is it says this. Oh, it gets rough. The ship suddenly broke up into pieces. And when it says they broke up, it broke up into pieces, the, 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 the image I get is all of a sudden your ship starts falling apart. And everything around you starts falling apart. And all, I'm going to go ahead and preach this. And all those friends that you thought would never leave you suddenly are nowhere to be found. And instead of getting someone to encourage you, you get four friends like Job had. He did have four, by the way, if you look at it. One, one other guy showed up. And they're going to tell you why you're going through the storm you're going through. And they said this to Job. Job, the reason you're going through the storm is you're a rich man. And you got so greedy with your money. And God's teaching you a lesson. And the next one comes along and says, Job, the reason you're going through, there's hidden sin in your life. If you wasn't sinning, God wouldn't be judging and the next one comes along and this one says I know what your problem is Job you were looking at women lustful and he said what are you talking about Job said I made a covenant with my eyes I wouldn't even look on a woman so Job's trying to defend himself against four friends and the Bible says if you'll go to Job chapter 39 40 41 42 read all that together you'll find out this is what God said to Job's friends ready you have not spoken that which is right about me before Job. I mean, all these guys' philosophical, religious, spiritual conversations were completely useless because they were not Job's comforters. They were Job's complainers. I don't even know why Bible scholars call them comforters. It says, and they came to comfort Job. They did no comforting. All they did was complain the entire time. So here's what happens. Here's the third level of the storm. I know you're too young to go through some of this, but you live long enough like me. You're going to be going through some of your Rockladons, baby. Come on. You're going, to, you're going to go through some of your You might as well get the message in you now. You might as well take your sermon notes now. You might as well keep your journal handy because when it hits, you're going to say, where's that sermon stoned in on that rock storm? Right? Put your hands together and shout yes one time if you hear what I'm saying. Oh, yeah. So now, storm's hitting. Sudden storm out of nowhere. Contrary winds. Stopping your momentum. You hear nothing from God. Mm -hmm. You're totally, completely stuck. Nothing's moving any kind. You need a financial breakthrough. Nobody's sending you a check. No rich uncle has died. Mom and dad's taxes found out that they got to pay them instead of get them back. Everything's not working like it's supposed to. Now the ship is totally breaking apart. All your friends have forsaken you. All the people that you thought would stand with you are not standing with you. That one person you thought would never leave you has suddenly betrayed you. Your ship has fallen apart. How bad? bad can it get? Well, here's what they did. They all came in, the Bible says, on broken pieces. Sometimes God will let you live your whole life completely whole, but sometimes you'll have a Jacob's limp the rest of your life. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes you have to come in on broken pieces. Well, that's pretty bad. They get to the island. <laughs> They're all gathering wood. You know, they're all wet. They're wanting to dry their clothes off. It's men. So I can see them here taking their shirts off and complaining. Oh, oh, the ship's gone. I just lost everything I got. They're collecting firewood. So Paul reaches down, being a good servant, 
to gather wood for the fire, and he has fastened on his finger a viper. I need to explain to you what this viper is because I did not know till I encountered one. Because I was in the Dead Sea area uh, several years ago. We were taping, and I looked down, and there was a little old cute snake about that long. As thin as my pinky finger. Yellow colors, like different colored design on it. And I just want to warn you now, if a snake has a flat head, run. If it's got that little curve round, they're usually non-poisonous. But if they're flat, they got that kind of weird looking flat head, just get away. Well, that had a flat head and I didn't know that. So I take a stick and I start flipping him. And he goes, <laughs> and I'm thinking, he's a baby, he can't do nothing. And my Jewish God grabbed my shirt, said, come here, back up. I said, from what? He, that? He said, back up, just do what I'm saying, back up. Because he said, he can move faster than you think. He's little, but he can move faster than you think. It's a little thing. It ain't much, but it'll move faster than you think. I must be some, preaching to someone. I feel conviction in the house right now. And I said, what's the deal? It's just a baby. He said, that's a viper. And he said, if that snake were to bite you and pierce your skin, you would die in five minutes before we could ever get you help. And then he went to this story. He said, go to the, he took me to the book of Acts. He said, when it says that the viper fastened on the hand of Paul, that's the kind of snake it was. He said, that is one of the most deadly snakes in all of the country. And I was stupid enough to play with that snake with a stick. <laughs> Think about it. Now, it's funny how people react to your problem. Because I want to show you how the people reacted when the snake bit Paul. And he holds it up. They see the color of it. They know what it is. And the first thing they say is, Ah, oh, he must be a murderer. The weird part about that statement is, ready? He was before his conversion. Wow. <laughs> you know, and they'll talk about something you did. And here's the point. It might be true. He was a murderer in his past life before. He must be a murderer. And now the gods are angry with him. See, they got the first part right, but the second part wrong. Because the gods were not angry at him. Now watch their reaction. Sir, so they're waiting for him to die. They're standing there waiting for the guy. He's going to drop over any minute now. There's another one. Well, we didn't lose nobody on the boat. We're about to lose this guy by a snake bite. Can you believe it? He survived the storm. He survived the quicksand. And now a snake bite's going to kill him. And the Bible says, And Paul shook it off into the fire and felt no harm. Touch a neighbor and say, Sometimes you got to shake it off. Now touch a neighbor and say, All the time you got to shake it off. Put your hands up and do a little bit of shaking right there. This is a bunch of young people tonight. Shake it a little bit. He shook it. And now, and then, and then watch what they do. Then he didn't die. And they said, oh, he's a god. Make up your mind. Either he's a great man of God or God is really mad at him. See, people are weird because they want to judge your storm or your snake bite. And they've always got the answer as to why you got bit and they didn't. I'm going to let that sink in for somebody in the house right here. Well, if you weren't so stupid, well, you know what? It takes stupid to know stupid. It's called dumb and dumber. Well, if you'd listen, well, how many of you have listened your whole life? Well, God's just trying to teach them a lesson. 
be careful because with the same judgment you judge, it's going to come back on you. Let me teach you something right here. People will say to me, what did you think about what happened, brother so-and-so? I said, I don't think about it. Well, 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 don't you have an opinion? No. One well-known preacher got up and said he wanted an airplane. And people are asking me, what do you think about so-and-so wanting that big million-dollar airplane? I said, none of my business. Well, I think it ought to be in the kingdom of God. I said, no, I haven't given him an offering in my lifetime. That's none of my business. That's the business of his partners, and that's the business of his church people. And if they think he needs it, it's up to them to deal with it, and it ain't none of my business. You see my nose? Let me just take my glasses off so you can look at that. I'm Italian, but I didn't get the hook in my nose like my other family members did. But I want you to know my nose is long, and the reason it's long is I kept it out of other people's business and gave it time to grow okay are y'all still here so now I look at this the storm the quicksand the broken ship and the snake bite and I ask myself what's the root to all of this why is the adversary so threatened by Paul getting to Rome? Stay with me now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, stay with me now. I have learned something. And I'm not talking about your basic trouble. You had a bad day. You got a migraine headache that's gone two or three days. Thank God it's going to go away. I'm talking about major stuff. When we have gone through things, I turn to my spiritual mentors or leaders, Tony Scott and Floyd LaHan or Rick. Rick's been with me since I was 18. And I had Tony Scott say to me sometime back, he said, I'm going to tell you something what God told me. God told me, Perry, not, not Tony, God. That the trouble you have dealt with is not about what you have done in the past to get you to this point in ministry. All the buildings you built, all the ministries you started... It's about where you're going. And every minister I've ever talked to has said this to me. When you come under a direct satanic attack, and most of the time a satanic attack will come through people's words or their ideas or their thoughts or their strategies. When you come under it, I want you to remember this. When it's very severe, it is not about where you've been. Because the in Ready? Because the enemy can't do anything about where you've been. Think about it. He cannot do anything about you once everything's forgiven. He can't do anything about you when everything's under the blood. So he cannot, watch, he cannot go back and undo what is done, good or bad, and neither can you. So why am I under attack? Because it's where you're going. Can I prove it to you? Stay with me because this gets real, this gets, now, now we're getting into some really rich, rich stuff in the word. I meditated on this and I said, why would the enemy want Paul dead before he got to Rome? And I, I started looking at the book of Romans. And I read Romans and at the very end of the book of Romans, Paul says this. The very God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Now, wait a minute. The, the book of Romans was written to the people in Rome. Paul is headed to Rome. But that wasn't the clincher. The clincher was Philippians 4.22. Now, greet the church in Caesar's house. Wait a minute. Did you catch it? Who's Caesar? Talk to me. Say it louder. Nero. Nero. Whoa, 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 whoa. So this guy that has orgies and even same-sex orgies, and I could tell you all this list of horror. I mean, this guy was really just as bad as it gets. He got a church in his house? He's not even a Christian. So how did a church get in his palace? Let the early church fathers answer it by the traditions that we have. The empress 
who was Nero's wife, became a believer. Could be why he killed her. What did I just tell you? He killed his wife, right? Then he marries a young man. Could be. Not saying it is. I'd have to do all the research on it. It is believed that her and a number of the servants held Bible studies secretly in the house but never made it known to the citizens. And Paul said, greet the church and the very God of peace shall bruise Satan. God, under your feet. Your feet. The believer's feet. Shortly. And I felt like the Spirit of God said to me, Paul had such an anointing of converting people. Look, think about the Herod. The Herod that killed the babies in Bethlehem. The Herod that beheaded John the Baptist. The Herod in Acts 12 who beheaded James. They're all related. And there's a fourth one called Herod Agrippa II. And Paul preaches in front of him. And what does it say in the book of Acts? Agrippa II, who was, he said, Agrippa, this was not done in a corner. This gospel, you know who I speak of. You know about this Christ. Paul could have said, you know about this Christ. One of your relatives killed the babies of Bethlehem. You know about this Christ. One of your family members beheaded John the Baptist. You know about this Christ. Agrippa the first beheaded James. You know about this Christ. The angel struck your relative and he died with worms after killing the man of God. Agrippa, this was not done in a corner. And Agrippa says, Paul, almost. You persuaded me to be a Christian. Do you remember reading that in the Bible? Now think about Paul's ability to take a family of cold-blooded murderers, wicked men, and get to that fourth one and come just that close. With a testimony. No miracle. No healing of a lame man at a gate. No blind person being healed. No sheriff going blind under the judgment of God. No Simon Mangus uh, coming under the judgment. No, 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 no. Nothing but I want to tell you what happened to me on the road to Damascus. A testimony. And Satan says, I hope you're listening. I cannot. I cannot let this Paul the apostle ever make it to Rome. Because if they got a church in the palace, what if he appeals to Nero and converts him? Then all the persecution stops. All the murdering of Christians stops. Then this gospel even spreads further in the empire. So here's what I'll do. I'll send the wind to stop him. But the wind couldn't stop him. I'll send quick stands to Stop him completely, but the quicksand. I'll make the ship break, but they came in on broken pieces. And finally, he said, I'll hide a viper under the wood. But the viper couldn't kill him. I've come by to tell somebody that when you've got a promise hanging over you, the storm cannot destroy you. The snake bite is not going to kill you. The demons and the devils through the mouth of ungodly people might try to take you out, but God is still going to raise you up because the calling of God is greater than the confusion of a bunch of people that they are trying to create. Clutch, put your hands together and praise God one time in this place. How? Oh, hallelujah. Watch what God does. Look, look. I think it's going to be really interesting to get to heaven when the knowledge of the Lord has covered the earth, the sea, and the sky, and all things are made clear. We no longer see through a glass darkly. Just to see how God strategized with angels to get stuff done while the enemy thought he was winning. God already had an outcome. <laughs> Nothing really. Think about it. I mean, think about it. Job will curse you to your face. And God's going, <laughs> really? Really? Take what he's got. He won't. He didn't do it. 
take his health, that's how he'll curse you. <laughs> really? Take his health. Go ahead. See, here's the thing. Satan could plot it, but he couldn't see Job's heart. Because the integrity of Job's heart and his love for God was greater than anything that he owned on the earth. It was greater than his wealth, greater than his kids, greater than his family. And God said, you think you know him, you don't know him. God Almighty, I feel his presence. All right, now watch what happens. So, i got to read this to you. They're on the island. The ship has been blown totally off course. But the point is this, and this is the thing about storm. I, I said to Karen the other day, my most puzzling thing that I've ever had to ask God is, the attack of the enemy was from the enemy, but God had it set up to be under the attack to get the alignment he wanted. How do you figure that? How do you figure? How do you figure you got to go through this crazy stuff to get... The snake's off. How, why do you have to go through crazy stuff when the ship is wrecked? But you still, you still are coming in on a broken piece. You're coming in on a broken piece. You survived the quicksand, the storm, and the sharks and everything else. And you're on the island saying, I don't know how I did that. Glory to God. Hallelujah. But I'm here. <laughs> Lost everything in the boat, but I'm here. So, because watch God. So God says... Years ago, an angel comes. Can I preach this my way? Mm. An angel comes to God and said, You know, all this gospel's going out, but there's an island called Melita, and there's no gospel message on it. What do you think we can do to get somebody to go there? And the father says, It's not on the regular shipping routes. It's not. You really got to go way out of the way, and there's just not much there. But, but Father, the gospel has to go out, but we've got to have the right man there. We've got to have the right person. So Paul's getting on a boat, yes, sir. Yes, sir. going this way. But God says, go ahead and let the wind hit, because we got to blow him that way. No, if you've not if you've not read what I'm about to show you, <laughs> I'm gonna give you an opportunity to shout in a minute because I'm gonna shout with you. <clears throat> They're stuck on this island three months. Now, in the same quarters were possession were were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and a bloody flux. Whom Paul entered in, prayed, laid his hands on him, and healed him. When this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came, and they were all healed. So, <laughs> see, your storm really might not be about you. It might be about who you're about to touch. I'm preaching myself. Paul said, I think myself happy. I'm preaching myself happy tonight. Huh? I think myself happy. So remember this. So when you go through it, you have to keep saying to yourself, this isn't about my past. The reason the enemy wants to always bring up your past is he'll get you stuck in your past and you'll never move forward. Amen. He's always going to bring it up and get you thinking about it because you'll never go forward. You always live in the back, live in the back, live in the back, live in the back. And you can't plow a straight line with the plow by looking backwards. Okay? So just remember when you're going through this, and, and, and they will hit, things will come, things will come that you brought on yourself, but things are also going to come that you didn't have. You didn't have it just, I mean, it was wrong place, wrong people, wrong time. Hello. It's going to happen. Remember what happens. you got to say to yourself, this is not about where I've been. This is about where I'm going. Keep, that's, that's the point. When, keep that in your head. It's about where I'm going. God knows there's something I'm going. There's something where I'm going. There's something I'm going to do. This is something trying to wear me out, wear me. T okay. I feel the Holy Ghost. 
Just say, sister, there's a spirit of confusion that's tried to come on you. To try to hinder, hinder what God would want. To, like, where, where, God, where am I going? What do I do? What am I supposed to do? What is all this about? You, you're, you're doing the thing you're supposed to do now, but you're looking out there in the future trying to say, where am I going to end up? God said, don't worry about it. He's already been out there. Just, he's all, in other words, let any fear be gone, any anxiety be gone. He's already been out there. He's already been out there. There's a couple of you young people here. You're already worried about where am I going, what am I supposed to do. Don't you understand this? He's already figured it out. Because he's already been there. So don't let there be any like, don't let the devil bring anxiety in your mind or confuse your mind as to say, okay, now, now where do I go from here? What's it from here? Do I, do, do I stay? Do I go? Do I move? Do I do? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. God's got an island somewhere. Ooh, who's that for? God's got an island somewhere. Are you still here? Say, I'm still here. I'm still here. Hmm. So, Paul gets on the island, starts laying hands on all the sick people, and a revival breaks out. But the only way this man would have been healed and the island would have been saved is it took a shipwreck. to sink in if I'm not preaching to nobody but me and us for it no more it took a situation to get him off course to get him on course right now you want to hear the cool part this is the cool part and I'm going to paraphrase this all in your Bible so three months they're on the island and you know what Paul's doing he's teaching everybody and all of a sudden this is so funny. And a ship from Alexander, Egypt, that has the symbols of Castor and Polis on top of it, that it's painted, it's pa okay, shows up at the dock. Publius says, I want you to load up Paul with everything he lost plus everything he needs, plus some stuff I want to give him. Publius says, now I want to take my head bodyguard and I want you to, I want you to go with this man and I want you to guard his stuff on the ship. I want you to make sure he gets there safely. Okay? But you don't understand the Castor and Polis part because that's Gemini, the, the Gemini twins, you know, in the heavens, the constellation. But I did some research on this and found out that when you have the Alexandra ship, you have the Cadillac of all ships because Alexandra made the best ships in the world. <laughs> what? Wait a minute, you're missing it. He was on a slave boat. <laughs> Who's rowing the boat? If it was a rowboat, it was, it, it was Paul was rowing. Now he's got a cruise line. <laughs> Seriously, this is what this boat was. He's got a cruise line, and it's got the emblem of cat, which means it is the number one ship made. And now, <laughs> think about three months before. Three. Mm, 90 days before. He is soaking wet, standing in sand with a viper on his hand, thinking everybody thinking he's dead. Ninety days later, he said, come on, boys, let's get that stuff on the boat. Come on, we got to get to Rome. Come on, fellas. Come on, that's right. Bring that package. Oh, what's that? Fine china, fine china. Yes, bring it right on the boat right there. What's that? Oh, some gold and silver? Good. Bring that. Some, that's, we're going to build some churches with that. Put that right there on the boat. And they're stacking a boat that's like a Cadillac ship. Hey, and when he gets to Rome, God, I feel the Holy Ghost all over me right now. Paul had talked about in the Corinthians how that he was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet him, lest he should be exalted above measure. And that word messenger is an angel of the devil that attacked him everywhere he went. Go to 2 Corinthians 11, read the 22 things Paul had to go through. He went through hell for the gospel. He bore in his body the marks of the gospel. He'd been stoned and left for dead, three times beaten with rod, shipwrecked the whole nine yards. Read it in your Bible. 
Then he says, I besought the Lord three times that this thorn, this devil, this angel would leave me alone. But God said, my grace is sufficient for you and my strength will be made perfect in weakness. But I would like for you. I'd like for you to go to one of the translations of the Bible and read what happened when he got to Rome. Here's what it said. And Paul spent two years in his own hired house, no man hindering him. So God not only got him to Rome, but when Nero burnt Rome down, he blamed it on Paul. And that's the only reason Paul got arrested was on a lie that he had burnt Rome down. He literally, as a Roman citizen, got to Rome. The Jewish people could no longer persecute him. The Pharisees had no no power there. He was a Roman citizen. He was a high-ranking Roman citizen. They already knew his name when he got there. They got him a house, and he had a house. And when they wanted to come in and hear the word, he taught the word and no man hindered him. That means I want, I want to preach. I want to give God a little bit of glory right here. I used to preach that Paul died with that thorn in the flesh, but he died with grace. No, he didn't die with that thorn because for two years God said, devil, time's up. You mess with this man long enough. You beat him up. You put him in shipwreck. You, uh, you hit him in the head. They slapped him with rods. But I'm going to let him preach two years unhindered with miracles and signs and wonders. I've got news for you. That hindering devil is not going to be on you the rest of your life. Don't you let the devil lie to you. That spirit that's attacked you has got to give up sometime. It does not have... Hallelujah. Somebody give your Jesus praise in this house. times let's bring can we let's make it practical for just a minute i don't have i'm almost done of course paul said finally my brethren wrote three more chapters so you never know when i say that <laughs> but i mean let me say this to you being someone who is a visionary which Pam, my wife will tell you perry's a visionary he sees it my problem is and it is a problem it's a challenge it's not a problem it's a, it's a good thing but i and the kind of person that the moment I see it, I go after it. It's like, God, you're moving too slow. We're gonna go, I'm going to make this happen right here. You're busy, you know. I asked a, a Catholic friend of mine one time, um, you know, he said, I pray to Mary. I said, why? He said, because Jesus is too busy. <laughs> it's kind of cute, really. I said, he's not, he's not too busy. He can, he can hear everybody pray, you know. So it's kind of like, okay, God, you're a little bit busy. I know you're taking care of all the, the world. Here, go take care of this. Uh, I'll give an example. I actually, I don't know if you know, Rick knows this because Rick's on my board. We had discussed, give me a minute, let me go back in time. One year, one year, year and a half ago maybe. I think it was, it, two, let's, say, let's say a year and a half ago it's been. We had a board meeting and I was going to build three things. I was going to build a railroad station. It looked like a railroad station, but it had a theater, a soda cafe, a game room, offices. And it, but it looked like, an, you'd, love, you'd have loved it, Karen, if it got built. And I was actually going to get a train up there, like a caboose, and that's what you eat in. It just, just a cool idea, you know, visionary. Yes, yes, oh, I like that, yeah. I'd say to Amanda, what do you think? She says, I think you need to pray about it. That's my daughter's answer to everything. Thank God. You need to pray about it. And then I was going to build dormitories. And I already had the dormitories drawn out. Pam, you remember this. We were already getting, uh, we were going to have, I'm, I'm funny because when I, if I'm going to build a building, I happen to know that girls need mirrors and more than guys. Guys take quick showers. Girls don't because I have a daughter. I know. Amanda, 45 minutes. Come on, girl. <laughs> um, so we had like 30 showers in each dorm, uh, three stories. Remember that, Rick? We had it all lined out. In the month of November, I know when it was now, I came back from Israel and God said, stop it all. Huh, what? Stop it all. 
I had to call my builder, who had to call the city, who had to call the permit department, who had to, I mean, it just went cold turkey. And then property opened up. We look, we went to this property and looked, and when I went to get this property, which I thought, and it had seven lakes on it, it had uh, 400 and some acres, and I'm, I'm a visionary. Oh, we could do this, we could do that, we could do this, we could farm it even, we could give farm, poor people food. Ah, blah, 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 blah. And it had seven liens against it. And I'm thinking, okay, what's going on here? Now watch what I'm about to say. Only God knew. Now that my total projects would have been $9 million. And COVID hit. And I didn't get to travel anywhere. And churches were shut. Are y'all not listening? Pay attention. Pay attention. If I would have gotten stubborn and said... But I'm just going to tell you something. The Lord told me to do it, and God don't change his mind. I'm going, to show, I'm, going to, I'm going to prove to you God will change his mind. Ready? Abraham, take thy son, thine only son, to Mount Moriah, the mountain I will show you, and offer him before me. Takes the wood, takes the boy, builds the altar, lays him down, puts the dagger up. Stop! No, don't offer him. Now, what if Abraham would have said, I, that cannot be God. That is the voice of the adversary. God has told me, slam that knife in his boy. It was a test. All it was was a test to see would he be obedient. God tested me to say, if I ask you to do it, will you do it? Yes. But he said, okay, now you can stop. Because can you imagine in COVID not preaching for almost a year, $9 million in debt I mean, the builders would have loved it because they're getting paid, but we, our ministry would have plummeted. I'm trying to say something to you, so pay very careful attention. <laughs> now, let's go ahead in time. I wanted to build a youth camp. But one thing always bugged me, there's a train on my property. And that train, if I built what I wanted to build, that train would shake every block loose. On that property in about three years, wouldn't it, Rick? I mean, if you're talking about, it depends on what you build. But, I mean, it go, you can feel the ground rumble. You're in that prayer barn praying. Brrr, brrr, brrr. I remember the first time the train came through and somebody said, oh, my God, it's a shofar. They was all, oh, it's a shofar. I said, it's a train, honey. It's a train. Calm down. <laughs> I'm like flypaper. I attract some very strange people. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, anyway. So watch this, because I want to I I teach you this. I want you to learn this, because you may need this somewhere in your life. Many years ago, when we were dating the Omega Center International Building, which is where Ramp is in Cleveland, and m many of you have already been there. When we were dedicating that building at a partner's conference, a couple was sitting there, and their name was Williams. Lyndon Steve Williams. Steve, I had bought the property that the... the Omega Center sits on, all, you know what I'm talking about, the, 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 all the property, not just the parking lot and the building, all that property was purchased from Steve Williams, and they were there that day. They had just bought a very lovely colonial-style three-story house with 80 acres with two lakes on it and ponds, and she was asking the Lord a little bit about, you know, God, what is this, what, you know, what is this for? What? And the Lord speaks to her and says it would be used for ministry. She told me later... I always felt it was for your ministry. And it's connected with youth or, or something. Okay. Now, I'm not going to say too much, Pam, by the way, of plans. I'm not that dumb. <laughs> I'm going to keep quiet. So I would go from time to time and I would ask Steve, are you going to sell that property? No, we're living up there now. So Linda loves it. Linda, you know, three years later. So, so this year, track with me, this year, for 30 days, God spoke to me and said, go see Steve. And he actually told me when to do it, and I let my wife talk me out of it. Yeah, I did. You did. He said, no, Perry, honey, you don't need to be looking at the property right now. Just, you know, get healed, get better, get, go, work your way in. That's just more care. She was, she was really trying to help me. I said, Pam, I'm telling you. So I go and call Steve a month after the Lord tells me to call him, and he says, you will not believe this. That went under contract two days ago. What? You mean I waited 10 years? I said, Steve, you told me. 
I had first option of that property. He said, you know what? I forgot about that. You, you, I did say that. When his wife found out that I had called, she could not sleep because she said, this is supposed to be your property and not the people getting it. And I'm not going to say too much because this is on the internet, but the people getting it were from out of state and they had plenty of money. They had, she's a lawyer and they'd won a huge lawsuit case and they could have wrote out 10 checks for the amount of that property. Not missed it. They already had the house inspection. They already had the earnest money. And it was going to sell the next day, right, Rick? Tomorrow the next day, they're sending the money from Florida. We're sitting there at the table in this beautiful million-dollar house, beautiful. And Linda says, I don't know what to do. There's nothing we can do. I mean, this, they want this, and we have a contract. There's just no way of getting out of it. What can we do? And Rick speaks up. Rick, let me tell you something. Rick Tao is a quiet man, but he's full of wisdom. No, I'm t no. When Rick speaks, E.F. Hutton listens. That's a commercial. I can tell you've not seen that commercial. <clears throat> he said, let me just tell you how it is. I believe that if Perry is supposed to have this property, those people will cancel their contract. They will cancel. You won't have to do anything. And I looked at Rick. I remember I said, Rick, and Steve was saying the same thing. I said, when you got that kind of money and they love this and they can't believe they're getting it for this price, they say if they had to pay for it down there, it would be worth three times more. They're freaking out. They want all the property around it. They've already asked for the other property. I, I'm not trying to be faithless, but I just don't. He said, no, if God ordained you to get this. <laughs> I got a text the next day. Steve said, you ain't going to believe what happened. At midnight last night, the couple texted us from Florida and said, we're canceling the contract. I am in shock. Okay? Before we drove down here, we signed papers. Now, you listen to me. Now, Rick, I'm not exaggerating. Of all the property in Bradley County, it is probably the second or third prettiest property we've ever seen in the county. Would you say that? I mean, that I've seen. We just closed on 160 acres. Now, you boys that like to hunt, Jensen Franklin called me and said, are you really buying that? Yes. He said, would you sell me about 20 acres of hunting? I said, no. I'll let you hunt free. We're like, me and Jensen go back a long way before he was ever married. Now, I now see, I now see what that property can be used for. And we won't, we won't get into that. Pam and I and Rick have agreed we don't, we don't discuss this publicly because people freak out on you. Then, you know. And uh, we're, we're praying. We already know some things. And then another piece of property, which we had rented to someone, will be coming open in two months. And the Lord has already showed me today. I had a vision. Folks, I was praying. And I shut my eyes. I mean, I usually see dark like everybody else. And I saw an absolute vision. And I, it was right there. And I'm talking to myself out loud. Oh, this is a vision. Wow, that's so cool. Look at that picture. Wow, look at that. And the Lord gave me an idea. And we, Pam and I had talked for three days. What are we going to do out there? What are we going to do out there? And he gave me the idea. Now, here's my point. The Lord is doing what he was going to do anyway. He's doing what he dealt with me about doing. But see, now instead of me having to build a dorm with a hundred, I already have a dorm with a hundred kids. I got a log dorm. It's there. Now I don't have to build. I don't have to build. It's there. I didn't know it would be there. I didn't know it would be. I didn't know it would come back up. God knows everything. Here's what you want to remember. If you are planning something, and, it, and this is for the ministry school. If you're planning something and it doesn't seem to be flowing, it could be that the dream is off. It's not the right dream yet. You may be getting a dream, but it's not the right dream yet. Or the team is off. 
I was going to move to the state of Virginia after Pam and I were married, and I'd have had the wrong board, the wrong people, and, oh, Lord, the wrong place. OCI wouldn't even be there today. Ramp wouldn't even be in Cleveland if I'd have moved to Virginia. And God let a storm hit up there. And I, Pam said, don't move up here. Don't you? I know you got 10,000 people you preach to, and they love you up here. And you could, you could, We could have started a church with 1,000 people if I'd have wanted to. I'm 22 years of age. God said, no. Wrong place. And I did not know. I did not know. Till years later, that in 1959, in the month of June, which is the month I was born, William Branham was in Cleveland, Tennessee, at a church on a hill with Brother Littlefield, and an angel of God appeared to him in a hotel room and said to him, before the coming of the Lord, Cleveland, Tennessee is going to be the hub of the last end time revival. Oh. William Branham, an angel in 1959 in June, same month I was born, and now we sit there right on the property and have all the VOE on one end. Look, VOE is down here, ramps in the middle, and Judy Jacobs is on the hill. Oh, I used to preach down there, and I told him, I said, I know what they're saying about me. Perry Stone's going to own the town. I said, no, I'm not going to own it, but all the people that are here are. And we're going to own this thing, run this thing, have the restaurants, have the hotels, have the buildings. And this is going to be Mecca for the Christian world one day. If you want to get saved, healed, and filled with the Holy Ghost, there's a place in Cleveland you can go. So sometimes the team is off. It's just not the right people. doesn't mean they're not good people. It doesn't mean they weren't supposed to be with you for a season. But they just can't go where you're going. And sometimes the timing is off. So God will allow storms, shipwrecks, and snake bites. And it's not because he don't like you. And it's not because you're worse than somebody else. And it's not always because you really did something bad. He's going to punish you for it. Sometimes it just is, you're wanting to get to Rome. I'll get you to Rome, but I have a little trip this way I need you to come on. Never lose your dream. But it may take a while. Final message, final word, final, final thing I want to tell you. I'm going to go into this. I'm going to go into this just in a little bit more detail without going into a lot of detail. Rick, we'll, Rick will remember this. And I'm going to go ahead and leave names out. This generation will, might not even know who I'm speaking of, which is fine. In February of 1988, I was preaching at a church in Zephyr, here, Zephyr, Zephyr Hills, Florida. Still see it. Shotgun Church. Two sections of pews. And orange was the color back then for some reason. There must have been a contractor from Tennessee. I mean, that You know, Tennessee Vols. That I don't know. Carpet was orange. The pews were orange. Everything was orange. Remember back then? Everything was orange back then. And uh, at 6 o'clock that evening, a little, it was around 6, Pam came running in and she says, Perry, there's a breaking news story about an evangelist that has had a real moral failure and the, his denomination has met with him. And it showed him and his son coming off a plane. And they were trying to, the news, you know how the news is. The news, just trying to get news. That's their job, I guess. And uh, so I knew who to call. I knew to call Rick. And the reason I knew to call Rick was his father-in-law was on this man's board. Was the biggest financial giver this man had in the world. And uh, I said, Rick, is this true? He said, well, we just got a call that there, there is something true with it. We don't know how deep it goes or whatever. And I go into depression. You, 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 it, was, it was as if you told me my mom and dad just got killed in a plane crash. It, really, it was depression. So as people gather into the church that night, you know, they're starting to hear, they're starting to hear. And it's, everybody, loved, everybody that I knew loved this guy, loved his preaching. So. And, uh, and still do, by the way. But... The depression was so heavy. I told the pastor, I watched the news that night, and it was all, it was everywhere now. And I said, dear Lord, what, what are we going to do? This is awful, especially for sinners. You know, sinners are critical anyway. And so I went to pray at this church on the front seat. And I said, pastor, I'm, I'm going to stay up all night. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to pray. I groaned. I cried. I travailed. I prayed for people. I prayed for the family. 
I prayed. I, did, I, I prayed everything I need to pray at three in the morning. Now this she this my wife knows exactly what I'm saying is true. At three o'clock in the morning, I'm laying on my back on that front pew, and I audibly hear manifest. And I jump up. I sit up. Manifest, but I didn't hear it. M a n i f e s t like a manifestation. I heard it. M a n n a manna from heaven. Fest. And I said, what is that? And I hear a voice, your television program. I didn't have one. In July, this man walked up to me and said, you are going to have a ministry similar to this man on television. I did not own a studio. I did not own a camera. I owned nothing. Remember that, Rick? Leeds, Alabama. I bet you forgot about that. You never forgot about that. 1988. I did, not, I did not build a studio. I did not go buy TV equipment. I hid the word in my heart. Stay with me now. You listening? When God tells you what you're going to do, it doesn't mean tomorrow. And you may do the thing that you really see many years after you do three things before you get there. Stay with me. I'm helping you if you listen from somebody who's been there. So I went home and told Pam Manifest. I said, God told me to have a TV program. I said, I don't want a TV program. You lose your privacy. You get criticized by people. I really don't want one. But God says I'm going to have one. I started getting invited to go on as a guest on Christian television. And I would preach and the phones would ring. They, 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 they had to bring phone workers, extra phones. There were phone, I mean, they would plug it in phones. We got to have help. We got to have help. Then they asked me, do you have any teaching? We want to do a telethon, but we'd like to use your material. If people give to the station, we'll give them your material. I said, no, but I'll come up with something. And I started doing prophecy videos. And from 1989 to 1999, I helped Christian TV stations. Every one of them. The only one I was not on at that time was TBN. I, all, all the others I, I was working with. Every year working with them. Rick, Rick will remember this. And we built enough income up to build a little studio. It was so small I had to sit down. I couldn't even stand up to teach. But we kept doing what we could do with what we had. Then in, then in the year 2000, I'm on the platform. Now listen to this. Listen to how, listen to how bizarre this gets. With the entire singing team of this man from 1988. His keyboard player, his drummer, his bass player, the whole team. Were you there, Rick, then? And they prophesied, it's time for you to go on TV. Twelve years later, Manifest went on. The Manifest telecast has been on TV for 22 years. No, tw 21, I'm sorry. 21. And on networks, networks, they have told me there are times it is the number one rated watch program in the entire United States, and other times it's the most watched program in the entire world. I'm not bragging. I'm telling you what God did. But I want to make the emphasis that I did not go out just because I heard the word and tell everybody. I hid it in my heart. People will mock your vision. Then it will discourage you. Then you'll say to yourself, did God really speak to me? So sometimes you just hide it. God may have something really heavy for you, and he just wants you to hide it. Pray about it. Hide it, okay? Twelve years later, I waited, and I waited, and I waited. And now we just purchased the top TV equipment in the world with a green screen. I don't know if you all understand green screen, but green screen means I can stand here and preach and hit a button and be in 1,000 places of the world. If I want to be inside the Dome of the Rock, I'll hit a button and I will stand there and teach to the whole world what it looks like is absolutely inside the Dome of the Rock. That's how most Hollywood movies are made and people don't realize it. They're made with the screens. Are you listening? But I had to be patient. You're young. You will have a lot of decisions to make. But I promise you, I promise you, just like this little sister, I don't know what that was about. I have no clue. But I just want to tell you, just flow. Just every day. Thank you, Lord, for today. Flow. 
you'll see everything come in time. All, whatever the Lord's put in your heart, it'll come in time. Woo! Would you just lift up your hands and begin to bless the Lord with me? Hallelujah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Lord God, we bless your name. We bless your name. We honor you today. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to share this word in my spirit, God, I feel that someone, someone has received this that needed it. There are a number of people, young people and folks in the building, who are, I know, I know there's a ramp graduation coming up, but there are some of you that are really asking the Lord now what do I do? And you've been in consternation about, you know, do, do, I, do I go there and kind of go, go, it goes back to the normal? Do I just go back and get a job? Do I, what do I do? Some of you are asking the Lord right now, where does it go from here in the next six months, three months or whatever? You, but you're praying about this. Those specifically who have really been intently asking God about this, stand to your feet. Would you do that just for a moment? There's just intently you've been... Now wait on the Lord with me for just a minute here. I think there's three things. I've told you this before, I believe, but I want to say this. I'm going to give you the three things that he's, that he's telling me. When you have a series of choices to make, only go with peace. Do not go because it looks good. Do not do it because your best friend's going to go there. But weigh it out. And you go with peace. Number two, for some reason, people have the idea that doing the will of God is going to be depressive, a burden, and a weight. The Bible says the commandments of God are not grievous. Now, I'm going to tell you something that sounds strange, but go with your excitement. Because God wants you to go do what you're excited about. There's nothing worse than going to a job you hate. Someone told me 88% of the American people don't like the job they work on. That means 88% of the American people are miserable every Monday. But what excites you? Is it working with kids? Is it, is it like when you see poor people, you're like, oh God, if I could just help them, I got to do something. That's where your excitement is. And I want to tell you number three, and I've never said this in my life, I've never heard this. Greatness is progressive. As an illustration, young men will come to our ministry and they'll see buildings and buildings. And oh, I have a warehouse four times as big as this with books and videos. And I can see it in their eyes. Well, I could do this too. Yes, you can. But let me take you to one book that I had to sell a drum set for, trade a drum set to get my first book printed. Let me show you a beat up car that leaked gas I had to drive in. Don't look and compare yourself with others that are doing more because you will always feel like if you're always comparing yourself with something big you will always feel you're doing less and somebody had to make the slingshot that David used he's not in the Bible but without him there'd be no story somebody had to trim the rod they gave to Moses they're not in the Bible but I'd sure like to know who the man was that handed it to him so what you do, this is the third word, might appear to be more behind the scenes and there's not much recognition to it and it doesn't even seem like there's much honor. But great, great things and greatness is always progressive because God says, I will never open up big doors till you first go through little ones. And I'll never bless you with more till I, 
you use what you've been given. Now let's lift our hands. I want to pray for you. Tonight God on this Sunday afternoon in Hamilton, Alabama as your servant all the young people that are standing all those that are on their, on their feet Lord they want to know your will. I preached here that there's the acceptable, there's the good, and there's also the perfect or the complete will of God. And I know how they are. Every one of them, want the, they want the complete perfect. But sometimes, Lord, you take them through processes and help them to understand the process, not to, dis, not to despise the process, not to despise the little. Help them to be faithful. This, the Lord says be faithful in the little things. Be faithful when you're asked to clean the church. Be faithful when you're asked to park cars in the parking lot. David said, I'd rather be a gatekeeper in the house of God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. God honors you when you do little things. When he sees your faithfulness in the little things. Get this in your spirit. When he sees the faithfulness in the little things, then he'll give you one more responsibility. He'll add on one more blessing. Everybody that is seated, point your hand over there or walk over to somebody and lay your hands on them and start praying in the Holy Ghost. Would you do that right now? If someone has stood up, go over there to where they're at. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We come into complete agreement right now for every one of these. This is so important. This is a moment of time in their life when they just want to know where, what your purpose is. The footsteps of a good, per, good person are ordered of the Lord. I'm asking you, every one of them, to order their footsteps. Order them. Direct it. God, in Jesus' name, whatever it might be, whatever it might be in Jesus' name, God, what excites their heart the most? What gives them peace the most? Help them to do it. Father, in Jesus' name, for those who desire to be here at the ramp, I command financial blessing to come and help to come in Jesus' name. Lord, that God's supernatural strength and ability will help them, whatever they need in Jesus' name. Let the Spirit of the Lord provide it for them. God, even the Apostle Paul worked and made tents with his own hands to help him in ministry when he was starting churches. God, none of these young people are afraid to work with their mind and work with their hands. Not a one of them. But I'm asking you, God, that what burns in them the most, that you will help them to be able to do. And I rebuke the spirit of discouragement off of you right now in the name of Jesus. Loose them from discouragement right now. This be gone out of their heart and out of their mind. And I ask the perfect peace of God that passes all understanding to bless every one of them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, as they pray here in the school and as they prepare for what is next, you will help them to know the will of God and the mind of God. That everything flow, everything will flow, everything will flow in Jesus' name. Everything will flow in Jesus' name. Everything will flow. Sometimes you'll have a plan. Sometimes you'll have, sometimes there's, there's something that's open. And just, just walk through what's opened now because it will not be where... It's not going to be permanent. The Holy Ghost has already showed somebody that this, that this what, you're going to, what you're doing now, what, what you've been asked to do now, you got, the Holy Ghost already showed you it's not permanent, but, but you're, you're kind of saying, okay, God, what's next? And what he's doing is saying, just do what I've told you to do now, and the door will open when the time comes. Okay? So do what you're doing now. Don't try to... Don't try to force anything, make it happen. It'll just start happening. It'll happen around you. It's just like those people canceling that contract. We had no idea that was going to happen. God did. It's just like this, this, this other thing that came open like, what, yesterday, wasn't it, Pam? Yesterday. And we had no idea that was going to happen. 
and God just tells us, do what you're doing. Because now listen, it's going to start accelerating. I'm telling y'all, there's going to be ramps coming up all over the place. There's a lady from Ramp Cleveland who's from Brazil, and their 12-year-old daughter had a vision of Ramp Brazil. Get this. Get this. Ready? I have on my phone a text I got this week from Brazil to go do a massive youth conference in Brazil. And this lady's prophesying about a ramp. Look, if I got to be the guy like John the Baptist to prepare the way and go into the nations and say, all right, who wants a ramp? All right, come on, Karen, bring them down here. I'll be the one to go preach and prepare the way. I'm just telling you, I'm excited to be around God that's doing something in these last days. Woo!